Great, so welcome everybody. I'm Catherine Olin, Programs Manager at the American Library in Paris. For those of you who are new to the American Library, just hearing about us for the very first time, we are, of course, a lending library, but we're also a vibrant cultural center and event space. Uh, for the moment, that event space has, of course, moved virtually to Zoom so that we can all stay safe and continue to gather during the pandemic. Um, so thanks for uh, thanks for bearing with us through through this past year of virtual events. It's it's been about I think nine or ten months now that we've uh, we've been doing this virtually, and we've actually had more and more interest throughout the months. So that's wonderful to see. I'm glad that you continue to to have a sustained interest in our programming. So the American Library is also an independent nonprofit. Uh, we don't receive support from either the French or American governments, but rather rely on the generosity of our community, our members, and especially our donors. So thank you to those of you in the audience who are supporters and donors to the American Library. Uh, 2020 wasn't all bad for us, actually. It was definitely a challenging year, but we also had the opportunity to celebrate our centennial. So we turned 100 in 2020, and we had a wonderful gala celebration virtually in October. And I think there are a few people here I recognize who were in attendance for that as well. So thank you for your support also during that event. Um, and I think we also have a bright year ahead. So we'll see when we're able to gather in person again. Um, but for the moment, you know, we're going to keep going virtually. And it's also great to have the opportunity to continue to connect with, um, with viewers from the States. I know that a lot of you said you'd be tuning in from someplace other than France tonight and especially in the US. So welcome if you're joining us from stateside, just like Rachel is, of course. Uh, you can learn more about us on our homepage or various social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. So check us out there and learn, learn more about our events. Um, this evening, I am delighted to welcome Dr. Rachel Mesh. She is professor of French and English at Ishaiva University in New York. In addition to Before Trans, uh, about which she'll be speaking to us this evening, um, she's also the author of Having It All in the Belle Epoque, How French Women Writers Invented the Modern Woman, and The Hysterics Revenge, French Women Writers at the Fin de Siecle. Her work has been supported by a National Endowment for the Humanities Public Scholar Fellowship. So thank you for being here, Rachel. It's an honor to have you, and uh, I'll hand it over now. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it is really a pleasure to escape the current realities and get to, to talk about this stuff. Um, and I'm just going to share my screen. Hmm. For some reason, Catherine, it is not giving me the option. Mm. Should I go ahead and make you full host and see if that solves things? Here we go. Here we go. Here. Oh, you got it? Okay. Okay. Is that working? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Great. Um, okay. So I just want to keep track of time here, but um, okay. Um, all right. So um, I thank you all for enduring yet another Zoom as well. I know uh, the screens can be a lot in these times. Um, so today I'm going to take you back to the 19th century, a time when gender roles were rapidly shifting in France um, for a variety of reasons, including urbanization, the expansion of the mass press, and advances in women's education. Um, and those shifts, the, result, the shifts that resulted from, from all those changes, the gender shifts, have been the focus of pretty much all of my work um, since my dissertation, actually. Um, and initially that was through a focus on French women writers. So I thought I was gonna, I would start today by kind of tracing that connection to walk you through how my previous book, um, Having It All in the Belle Epoque, led to this work on trans identity in the 19th century. Um, and so I'll read a few excerpts along the way um, after sketching that connection from before trans. Um, and I'll wrap up by sharing some of my favorite research finds from the process. So in having it all in the Belle Epoque, I looked at how the first two women's photographic magazines, Femina and La Vie Heureuse, tried to combat the French woman writer's terrible reputation as it had evolved over the course of the 19th century. Um, with uh, had, the French woman writer known at the time as the Bas Bleu had um, been associated with pretty much the downfall of French society. Um, depicted as man-hating, husband-defying, cigarette-smoking, child-neglecting. 
um, and really a, a huge threat to the French family. The shorthand for this can be seen in the famous artist and characterist Dunier's series on the Bableau, the blue stockings, that um, word for the, for the woman writer in the 19th century. Um, and so you can see how she was depicted and that pretty much continued throughout the century. There was a tremendous anxiety around the woman writer. And so when I came to the women's magazines, I was struck by how they were working precisely against that. This is around 1900 um, that these magazines were launched. So you have on the right here, um, the writer Danielle Le Sueur, who was the first woman in France to receive the Legion of Honor. And you can see her um, elegantly clutching her pearls, a far cry from that earlier image. Um, this image of Marcel Tiner, another very popular woman writer from the same time, is from um, La Vie Heureuse. She's holding her manuscript in one hand, her baby in the other, because we can balance femininity and feminism, these magazines taught us. And it's really um, very starkly an antidote to that image of the baby um, in the bathwater as the woman writes furiously furiously away. So that's what I was fascinated by in studying and having it all in the belly pot, these, these magazines. Um, and it was in the context of that research, after seeing image after image of women just looking absolutely fabulo fabulous, but in ways that accentuated their femininity, even if they were playing tennis, um, that I came across Jane de la Foy, who is the first figure in Before Trance. Um, and so as you see here, Jules Lafoy is sitting in her living room in Paris wearing an elegant man's suit. She was in these magazines speaking out against divorce, often pictured side by side with her husband Marcel. Um, and then this famous portrait of Jules Lafoy is after she rose up to battle with her husband during the Franco-Prussian War, which broke out just months after they were married. Um, now, despite this distinct appearance, Jules Lafoy was very much a part of the world of these magazines that I was tracing. She was a part of the literary, the women's literary community of Femina and La Vieuse in the sense that she was a member of the original jury um, for their literary prize, the Prix Vieuse, which led to the prize that you may recognize, the Prix Femina, that same prize, the Femina prize that exists today and is very much coveted. She was part of that. Um, and her, her appearance was simply understood as an expression of feminism, despite the fact that it was so out of sync with that of her peers. Um, but I had the sense that there was something else going on here and was very curious about it. As someone who had really devoted my career to studying French feminism from this time period, I felt like there was something that I was missing and something else that I needed to get at with Jules Lafoy. Now, Jules Lafoy's pants wearing um, was not a new discovery. I'll come back to that um, in a moment. Um, Scholars familiar with this time period, particularly those who had written about women writers, knew about Jules Lafoy. It wasn't that I sort of discovered this long lost person, but they always had considered Jules Lafoy through the lens of feminism. And that's really been the only lens for understanding um, people who refuse to conform to 19th century conventions of femininity. And truthfully, feminism, feminist history, women's studies is the reason that I knew about all three of the writers in my study, Jane de la Foy, Rachild, and Marc de Montifaut. Um, but I discovered when that's our only framework, when feminism is our only framework for understanding the past, we lose a whole other aspect of gender history, which is that of trans history and queer history because we're simply not asking the right kinds of questions and we're not accounting for what was at stake for those who experienced gender variance in the past. And so that's what Before Trans seeks to address. So Before Trans is a triple biography of three figures, these three figures who experienced their gender in complex ways that didn't fit into 19th century categories. And I use the modern trans framework in order to understand them better. And in particular to see that their refusal to behave in certain expected ways wasn't in order to reject patriarchal structures as has been assumed for all three, but rather the gender binary. And in some cases, the category of woman itself. In other words, their struggles and their writings weren't about advocacy on behalf of women or about women's rights specifically, but instead it was about coming to terms with who they were as individuals who really didn't see themselves as women at all. And this was a time in which there wasn't yet a way to talk about such an identity. 
even with the beginnings of sexology in the late 19th century, in this very period in which they lived, transgender did not exist yet as a medical or a social category. So a big part of these writers' work was to create a framework for self-understanding, to find words and narratives through which to define themselves. And they did that by writing stories, stories about themselves, stories that grappled with the narratives that their culture supplied about gender in different ways, and stories that we can now recognize through our modern lens um, as stories about trans identity. So I'm offering a context a framework for an inclusive trans history that stretches back to before there was language to talk about it as such. And that's sort of the complex thing about it is that I'm using this 20, 20 and 21st century lens to talk about the 19th century and 19th century experiences. Um, that's the, the beforeness really of the title. Um, and, but in that sense, I'm offering a set of questions, a context for a set of questions around gender identity that have too often been mistakenly conceived of as new when actually it's the language that we have to talk about trans that's new, but not the questions, the realities, the experiences that eventually allowed that language to emerge. Um, so just before I'm gonna read you a little bit from the introduction of the book, but I just wanted to mention something about um, pronouns, which was a complicated question because of that bridge between 21st and 19th century. Um, I chose to use feminine pronouns in the book, which I felt preserved the disjunction between these writers' sense of self and the language available through which to express themselves. And I did that knowing that had they lived today, they might very well, and I think likely would have chosen different pronouns, but I didn't wanna guess which one or be responsible for that very, very personal choice. Um, what sort of happened, and I've noticed as I've come to speak about the book since its publication is that once you've read it and heard their life stories, you sort of want to switch pronouns uh, by the end. Um, and I wanna note that scholars and historians in particular have started using the pronoun they, them in English. Of course, the other complexity is that this isn't really a possibility in French in the same way. Um, but we use they, them to say, we don't really know what pronoun, but we want to designate these figures as people who were questioning their gender. Um, and so I really invite that, and I do that as well. And um, it's, um, it's become a practice in the US also for people sometimes to say any pronoun. And that's kind of how I feel about trans history at this point, with the mix up the pronouns, which helps convey the expansiveness of gender expression for the past and helps capture in this case, the fluidity in which these figures who some of them experimented with pronouns themselves, that's the fluidity in which they had to live. Um, and this also helps us remember that when we're talking about the past and we're using she, her, or he, him, that doesn't really tell us something about the gender identity of these people because they didn't have the choice, they didn't have that option that wasn't the practice of, of speaking in different pronouns. And so I really want to unsettle that as well. Okay, so that said, I'm gonna read you a bit um, from the beginning of the book, which gives you a sense of, kind of how I'm framing things and will like, take us through kind of the life stories of, of these three. Jean de la Foy might be the most famous French person you have never heard of. In 1882, Jules and her husband Marcel, a civil engineer and architecture enthusiast, left their comfortable home in the southern city of Toulouse to travel the unpaved roads and mountain paths of Baghdad and Turkey all the way to Persia in what is modern day Iran. They hoped to excavate the ancient city of Susa, which British explorer William K. Loftus had located decades earlier, but failed to unearth. What they found exceeded their wildest expectations. Extensive palaces buried underneath the sandy rock strewn hills, forgotten by time and nature. After two government sponsored missions, the couple finally returned to France in 1886 with 40 tons of artifacts from the royal homes of Darius and Artaxerxes. Resettled in Paris, they were celebrated with the opening of the Salle du La Foi at the Louvre leading to record-breaking crowds for the museum's new department of oriental antiquities, which of course, perhaps you may have visited um, and you can visit um, to this day. Jane and Marcel du Lafoy were a veritable fin de siècle power couple. They lectured about town, hosted an exclusive salon where they staged theatrical performances, hobnobbed with the prime minister and were regularly invited to President Felix Faure's receptions. All the while, the staunchly Catholic Jules Lafoy 
went about in the most stylish men's suits. Dunafoy first appeared in men's clothing when she fought alongside Marcel in the Franco-Prussian War just months after they were married. She returned this practice on the voyages to Persia a decade later, never to wear skirts again. This despite the fact that it was hardly fashionable for upper-class Parisians to do so, and certainly not in her socially conservative milieu, where feminism was something of a dirty word and corsets remained the unchallenged norm. Judafois and her peers recognized the intellectual capabilities of women and supported their effort to take on increasingly visible roles. But within this social sphere, women were careful not to appear rebellious in order to compare, to avoid comparison with the menacing figure of the feminist seeking emancipation or the new woman, the Anglo-Saxon import who embraced professional roles and did not always choose marriage over independence. Both were perceived as a threat to French traditions and values. Instead, shifts in gender roles in Dulafois' upper bourgeois circles were contingent on balancing modernity with conventional notions of womanhood, career with domestic roles, and of remaining feminine in the process. And that's the world, of course, of the magazines that I showed you before. Nonetheless, Dulafois had secured a permission de travestissement, a pants permit, from the police. And this isn't hers, this is actually Rosa Bonheur's, which is in um, the Café Rosa Bonheur. For it was illegal in the 19th century for Parisian women to circulate in men's clothing without one. As of the city ordinance established in 1800, any woman who wishes to dress as a man was required to have the signature of a health official attesting to her medical need to do so. It's unclear how Dulafois qualified as no record of her actual application remains. She was one of only a handful to take this measure. Dulafois uh, found a way to express her gender in a way that to all appearances made her comfortable and confident, but there were signs that as she lived this unconventional life, she puzzled over who she was. She kept a notebook filled with clippings containing any mention of gender crossing or pants permits from current events, social commentary or fiction. When her own name appeared in these accounts, it was underlined with blue pencil. She also had an archive of unpublished manuscripts of gender crossers across time. This is not um, the actual notebook that I refer to, but it's, it's, it's the look of it. Uh, it's from a different scrapbook that she has um, in her archives. So the name Rachild may have also appeared in those pages, for she too had secured the pants permit at around the same time as Jules Lafoy. Born Marguerite Emery, she had abandoned her rural home for Paris upon turning 21 in 1881. Taking the name of a Swedish nobleman who she claimed to have channeled during a family seance, she found her way to the bohemian literary scene, eventually appearing at balls and cafes dressed in men's clothing. She had cut off her hair, stopped powdering her face, and began wearing bigger shoes as well. So while Dulafois was digging up ruins in Persia, Rachel released her decadent novel, Monsieur Venus, with an enthusiastic Belgian publisher in 1884. The book earned her a hefty fine and a prison sentence, which she avoided by staying in Paris, while also making her the sweetheart of the Parisian literary circuit. Unlike Jules Lafoy, Rachel seemed to embrace her identity as a rebel, even to cultivate it as a reputation, while steering clear of any identification with women writers or feminism. Her calling card, as you see in the middle here, read Rachild, Man of Letters. But at the same time as she was building a reputation for wild antics, Rachild felt deeply vulnerable and struggled for stability. In 1889, she surprised those who had come to think of her as an eccentric rebel by marrying the writer Alfred Ballet, choosing intellectual affinity and friendship over romantic inclination. She described that marriage as a form of suicide. At that point, she put her pants away and began working with Valette to revive the famed literary journal, the Mercure de France, becoming one of the most influential critics of the time as its chief book reviewer. Still, Rachel continued to rail against the confines of her sex in fiction and plays that pressed hard against gender norms and conventional sexual categories. In her writing, Rachel imagined her avatars alternately as a monster, an hysteric, an animal, a werewolf, a man. She was never entirely sure what she was or who she was, but she was sure that the term woman did not describe her. In Dunafois' notebook, another name appears next to her own with striking frequency, Marc de Montifou, the name by which the writer christened Marie-Amélie Chartreau de Montifou was best known. <laughs> 
She too had received official permission to wear pants. Like Jiafua, she wore tailored men's suits and a man's haircut for most of her life. Multifu had, had, began, had began her career as an art critic and her work in that domain has recently be, been recognized. But it was not her essays that made headlines in Multifu's day. She published dozens of anti-clerical tales for which she was incessantly and disproportionately pursued by the French censors. Some of whom were enraged that the writer they had assumed was a man did not appear as they assumed. In 1887, in 1877, Multifu was charged with offense to public decency and sentenced to prison. She would serve time in an asylum instead. The legal thrashing did not stop her from continuing to write. Despite repeated death threats and attempted poisoning and setups meant to prove her sexual impropriety, she continued to churn out controversial historical works in addition to works of fiction that mocked the political forces out to get her. Um, these are some of her censored writings. In some of these writings, Multifu celebrated historical figures who had been persecuted for their difference or simply misunderstood, including the Abbé de Choisy, one of the gender crossers of whom Jules Foy had also written an historical account. And in, in all three of them, there's this um, connection through their looking to the past to find models for their own identity. When Multifu returned to Paris in 18, 1882, after fleeing her latest prison sentence, she was no longer the awkward veiled young woman described in the press accounts of her trials. She had taken to wearing men's suits, as she would for the rest of her life. With her closely cropped hair framing her broad square jaw, she easily passed for a man, and many of her friends and colleagues would sometimes address her with masculine pronouns. Defiant to the core, Montifou seemed perplexed that her behavior could be anyone's business but her own. Je suis moi, she wrote, I am myself, myself alone, which is certainly not enough, but ultimately, I am me. It was a tacit acknowledgement that her life, like Jules and Rachild's, had no clear referent within the, within the gender stratified social structures of her time. Okay, so that sort of takes you um, through sort of the broad strokes of um, their life stories. But I wanted to address another aspect of my framing, which is the notion of the gender story, because the book isn't really just comprehensive biographies. Um, it is three life, I present these life stories by tracing how each writer came to understand their gender nonconformity and express it. Um, and so in the sense, they're biographies of identity and self-understanding because all three of them were writers um, and the way they did that was largely through storytelling. And so I was kind of inspired by this work by the contemporary singer songwriter, Ray Spoon, who writes, more and more I've thought of gender as a story that I tell myself. And so I wondered to what extent was gender a story that one told oneself in 19th century Paris? Um, when you don't have a word to understand yourself, you often come up with a story instead. This is something many of us do naturally. Stories allow depth and narrative in place of the fixity of a, of a label or a single term. And that's what I'm following in each biography, the way in which these writers made sense of themselves through their writing, how they worked to settle themselves into narrative and adapted those narratives over time. Because those stories we tell about ourselves, they're always changing in relationship to other stories we, we, we come across and as we evolve and grow. And I argue really in the book that the stories were in a sense life-saving for these writers, um, certainly life-determining. The stories gave them what Rachel would call freedom through imagination. And their storytelling allowed them to be gender creative, which is a kind of contemporary term for talking about gender nonconformity, um, rather than gender normative. And so this is a book about 19th century French writers, but it's also a book about 19th century French history and culture because these figures did that work by grappling with the stories being told around them. Um, in this place and time, gender was actually everywhere. So they're trying to understand themselves in relationship to the mass press, in relationship to fiction. This is the time of Flaubert, of Baudelaire, of Zola, of so many writers kind of exploring um, sexual and gender identity, you know, obviously not in those terms. Um, they explored themselves through contact with visual culture. This is the era of the Impressionists. This is Manet and Renoir and Kai Butts and people depicting um, gender in all kinds of ways in art, it's the era of science and medicine. Um, and so in this way, it's not so different from our current moment. If you're exploring your gender identity 
now you're watching films and movies and reading books and social media and you're sorting out who you are in relationship to those things. But the explosion of this kind of mass culture in the late 19th century, it was a similar kind of phenomenon and tracing their life stories meant looking at how they were reacting to the culture, differentiating um, from these kinds of stories that were all around them. And they did this through very different approaches because they were from overlapping, but very different um, social milieu. So I wanted to, to take us back to Du Lafoy for a few minutes, just give you a little bit of a sense um, of what that, um, what the gender story looked like in practice. Um, for Du Lafoy, and that section of the book is called Masculinity from God and Country, because this was really the grand narrative that Du Lafoy came up for himself. Um, and uh, they model themselves on a very conservative masculine ideal, that of the French imperialist, um, the one who would bring big chunks of Persia back to put on display in the Louvre, and that was considered an act of heroism. Um, and it was part, in part by being so successful at that, that they were accepted in this upper class society despite their gender nonconformity. Um, so to read you uh, just a little bit about how Julafoy came to think of herself, I will return to the book um, for a moment. So um, this here I'm explaining how Julafoy differentiated um, himself from those publications, the magazines that I mentioned, Femina and La Vieras. While Julafoy agreed to be featured in these publications, she did not see herself as a modern woman. And that rubric of the modern woman, la femme moderne, was really this kind of apolitical category um, of this female achiever who was not really involved in politics. In order to advocate for a better future, she always turned towards the past, where Julafoy found a handful of examples of a less rigid model of femininity. In the process, she rationalized her comfort in what was an almost entirely male milieu and reconciled it with her conservative values. It was not that she rejected femininity, her writings suggest. It was that she rejected current models of it. If she was not a modern woman then, Jules Foy fancied herself an ancient one. Through an historical paradigm developed over the course of her life, Jules Foy eventually came to understand that she was exceptional because she was born in the wrong time period. Rather than, be than believing that the problem lay in herself, she put the onus on a society that could not accommodate her. Over the course of her life, Jurafoy constructed her own gender story, a consistent and repeated narrative that either ignored or rejected the cultural norms of her peers and which I traced through her novels and writings. Through this story, she situated her masculine identifications in a broader context and affirmed them as natural. The Franco-Prussian War was a crucial step in the development of Jolafoy's self-awareness, as it forced her to recognize her difference from other women. Conscious of her courage, she also sensed her right to a full existence despite this difference, through an understanding of what she might have to offer France as, quote, an instrument of salvation. And so she began to cultivate an essential part of her lifelong narrative. As a conservative and devout Catholic, Jolafoy would allow herself the distinct pleasures that masculinity afforded to the extent that she was acting in service of a higher cause. She seemed to have discovered on the battlefield that assuming a masculine identity could be a way of serving France. In her pseudo-autobiographical novels of gender crossing and in the later travelogues from her missions to Persia, this is the story that she constructs for herself over and again. That of a woman who passes as a man for the greater good who is ultimately recognized and affirmed as a new kind of hero by everyone around her without having to relinquish her masculinity. Um, so, um, in terms of how that plays out, that gender story um, in her writings, it starts with the travelogues, which she wrote when she was in Persia, she started sending them um, back to France. And this has actually made her into a celebrity before she even returned, before they had even fully discovered what they would return to the Louvre with. Um, and so these travelogues were published in the Tour du Monde, travel, a new travel journal. And then later the thing on the right is this beautifully um, uh, put together volume of, the, of all of the, um, the 
issues that she had written. Um, so it's, you know, many, many, many hundreds, if not thousands of pages, actually. It's two, vol two enormous vol volumes. Um, and she did this also in the novels that she wrote. So the one on the left is Frère Pelage, that was um, one of the first novels that Julafa wrote about a male, a, a young woman who transitions into becoming really a male character. I, I have it side by side here with Monsieur Venus, which is Rachild's novel because they were they're written in absolutely different styles. Julafa was writing very dry, seemingly historical fiction, um, while Monsieur Venus is written in a very flamboyant, decadent style. Um, but they're kind of doing something very similar, even in the kind of mirrored titles here which refer to that gender crossed uh, main caricature, caricature. So um, this novel tells of both this Frère Pellage and, and Julafois novel Volontaire, Volunteer, tell, talk of women, tell the stories of young women who take on masculine identities and then go on to become national heroes. This is how Julafois saw herself and excused herself. She, like Joan of Arc, Arc whom she references in Frère Pellage, wore pants to please God. Um, and you see in that story, actually, in both of the novels, a real tension, a real pain, a confusion, because it's, it's not a choice. It's something that, and it's not a rebellion as it's so often considered when a woman wears pants in the 19th century, um, but it's more of a responsibility to herself. This is who Judafwa is, and it's really powerful when I realized this was sort of what was going on in the novels to, to see that in this, um, in this book. So um, the last piece that I wanna share with you here, just checking on our time, okay, um, is um, some of my research finds because um, sometimes these seemingly small finds, um, you might call them ephemera, contain so much information and that's such, so much the joy and the pleasure of the process. So it's always fun to talk about. Um, this is a telegram that was sent from Persia um, when I believe through Turkey that I found in the Archive National in Paris. Um, and you can see it's addressed to Ronchot, the director of the Louvre Museum who was sponsoring and kind of coordinating this trip. And it says, you know, découverte inespérée, like un, 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 unhoped for discoveries, send more ships. Um, and it's just a remarkable little piece of paper. You know, you get these boxes of things. And I remember my heart just started pounding. Um, and what it clued me into was that in those hundreds, if not thousands of pages of tra travelogues that are, they were, Judith was a very erudite person. So it's full of details and measurements and maps in addition to pretty exciting adventures. Um, I, it, was, it was sort of, uh, it, was, it was daunting to figure out what, could, what information could be there for me about her identity. But um, I realized that the moment, the turning point for them was this discovery. And so pulling into the state and the kind of emotion around it allowed me to see that point in the travelogues. And sure enough, when I went to that point, looked at those dates and the months around them, that's when the story gets really interesting. And that's when Julafois starts putting himself on the page. This is a photograph because they were also, there are hundreds of photographs and there are about 60 of them in the book um, that Julafois took for this mission. Um, and this is one that was never published, so part of their private albums, but you see the comfort in the masculine identity here and the ease. And this photograph also, when I came across it in uh, one of the libraries, um, also made my heart beat faster um, because it conveyed so much. So those two pieces go together because they're exa exactly the same moment in time. That discovery, and that's the gender story, right? That discovery is what authorized her to feel that um, you know, forgotten country. She could be a man. This is a, another small piece um, is a letter that I found in Marc de Montifou's archive, which is at the um, Bibliothèque Marguerite Durand, the feminist library in Paris. That's a letter from a friend explaining to Montifou that they could wear pants in public for an upcoming lecture, I believe it was, despite not having sort of the physical um, permission that we saw um, earlier. And um, what was so powerful about this, it's a very, um, it's a very formal letter, chère madame, um, but it shows how much was at stake for them personally. And it shows, it's a window into the need to navigate how to safely appear in public. This letter shows us that wearing pants was not an act of defiance um, for any of these three. 
but of personal expression of identity that was dangerous but necessary and and had to be kept very discreet and the writer says uh, don't worry I didn't use your name I just checked that this was okay and you know my wife and kids send send you regards um, and so this is something that Montifo didn't speak about specifically in their writing um, but having this information allowed me to read their writing differently and to see that that part of the story that was actually present if it couldn't be explicitly um, said. Um, and so then the final thing that I'll share with you, which I will um, take you through um, in my conclusion is not a small thing, but a large thing, which was, um, well, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll narrate it and, uh, and then we'll, we'll go to questions. Um, so in the summer of 2018, I stumbled into Jane Dulafois's living room. I was in Paris conducting some final research for the book during a sweltering heat wave in late June. Temperatures were making their way to the upper 90s as I faced off against a list of still needed sources. The hunt took me far from the modern comforts of the French National Library, which had air conditioning, but required room reservations and long waits. Instead, I was scrambling around the city to smaller, older venues that even in the heat were more pleasant to work in. At the Bibliothèque Historique de la Ville de Paris, which is uh, pictured here, the, the courtyard, I could peruse the pages of certain rare editions of newspapers and magazines that the National Library would only offer in microfilm, if at all. What's more, the BHVP was housed in the former home of Dion de France, daughter of Henry II. It's a gorgeous 16th century mansion nestled among the winding, winding streets of the charming Marie neighborhood, the Paris of Balzac and Hugo. I'd also been to the library at the Institut de France, the seat of the Académie Française. In the late 19th century, the Institute, which houses the French Academies of Arts, Letters, and Sciences, was known metonymically as La Coupole. Its famous cupola, pictured here, stands directly opposite the Louvre, on the other side of the Seine, connected by the Pont des Arts. Official entry into La Coupole marks the highest form of intellectual achievement. One doesn't enter la coupole, it is said, but is rather received there. Only when one member dies can another be elected to join its ranks. Because remarkably, Marcel Dulafoy had been selected for this honor, both Jane's and Marcel's archives are there. He had become an immortel, an immortal one, as members are dubbed, together with the Abbé de Choisy of long before. So it was something of a coup, pardon the word, that's a whole new <laughs> sense now. Um, but it was something of a coup to get to work in their library, since to be admitted, one needs permission from a living immortel, something I had improbably secured. It was always a thrill to breeze through the entrance gates on the Quai de Conti and make my way to the 19th century reading room, even if it was stifling indoors in the summer heat. While the official archives are at the Institute, I had known for a while that Marcel bequeathed the Du La Foi home to the Red Cross organization, and that it served as some sort of headquarters. I had heard that the 1870 portrait of Jane as a soldier was hanging there, but I wasn't sure that a trip to the Passy neighborhood near the Eiffel Tower was worth my precious research time, especially in the relentless heat. I had photographs of the painting after all. I couldn't reach anyone on the phone when I tried to call, just one of those maddening phone trees. The hours weren't posted anywhere, but since many of the smaller archives didn't open until the afternoon, I decided to take my chances one morning. It seemed at least worth a shot. I found a bus that took me directly from where I was staying in central Paris to the 16th arrondissement, and I found the building easily. A squat standalone structure, magisterial all the same. Entrance seemed, entrance seemed doubtful at first. I rang the bell and an answering machine picked up again. I tried again, reasoning the trip would have been worth it just for having seen the outside of the house and taken a photo of the small plaque that marked it as a patrimonial site. But then someone answered. I'm an American scholar working on Madame de la Foi, I offered. I was ushered in immediately, directed to the second floor. A door opened, and there was Jane de la Foi's living room. Not just the painting of her, but much of the decor, the wallpaper, the ceiling, the cornices, the fireplace. In some ways, it was just as I had seen it in photographs. I recognize, and there's, there's the painting that we that we started with. Um, unfortunately, um, it is in the glare of the Parisian sun and suffering very much from it. Very, very sad. Um, so 
and here is the fireplace, right? The dramatic, dramatic, I recognize the dramatic chimney in front of which she sometimes posed for pictures, tiny beneath the sweeping heights of the floor to ceiling fixture. But the black and white reproductions had not done it justice. I had to catch my breath to take it all in, this coming together of the image on my computer and the reality in front of me. There's something especially powerful about this kind of unmediated contact with the object of your research. I felt as though I'd walked into a time capsule, even though there was also plenty of modern clutter, plastic conference tables and chairs, papers lying around. In the back stood a red and gold break front, um, stuffed with bits of colored pottery. Apparently, not all of their spines ended up in the Louvre. I looked closer at the fireplace. This the focal point of the room. It was indeed a veritable marvel, as the women's magazine Femina had described it in 1902. The engravings that embellished the mantle were painted in startlingly vibrant colors, which I had never before appreciated. The scene depicts the mythological story of Perseus slaying the Gorgon. Shirley must have chosen the scene in honor of Persia's namesake. The whole room is a blend of Persia and Paris, signaling the Dulafois' double alliances. The scene of Perseus on the mantle is crowned by a series of fleurs de lis, those flowers long associated with the French throne, and dotted with daisies like those found on the Persian, Persian archers now on display in the Louvre, and that's on the right, which Dulafoy called the Immortelle, as well as her sons. Did she suspect that their discovery would guarantee Marcel entry into that illustrious academy, making him an Immortelle? Did she realize they would secure her legacy as well? So I will leave it there um, and uh, open it up for questions. Great, thank you so much, Rachel, for this wonderful presentation and also the, the rich narration at the end of your, of your research process. So it was, it was quite the journey you just took us on. It's fantastic. Um, yeah, so we do have time for questions. Um, if anybody has any, please go ahead and submit them via the chat feature and I'll read them aloud. And also um, maybe while we're waiting for those questions to to flow in here, Rachel, maybe you wanted to let us know if you had any ideas of where we should where we should buy your book. Um, I'll go ahead and drop a, uh, a link in the chat to your um, your publisher. Uh, so this is directly through Stanford University Press. But um, if you have any other tips to share for us, those would be great. Um, sure. Well, as I say, wherever books are sold. Um, Bookshop.org is always a great organization to support in the States, supporting small uh, independent bookstores during this time. So you can get it there. If you're not um, in the US or Canada, it is probably easier just to get it through Amazon because um, it ships very quickly and directly and it's pretty reasonably priced um, that way as well. There's a winter sale at Stanford that's 40% off now. So I think the book is $18, which is um, a pretty incredible for, um, for this kind of book. So. I hope you will enjoy it. Yeah, thank you. And I've included the um, the code there in the chat for anybody who's interested in obtaining the book directly through the publisher as well. Um, although just note the code is only um, going to work if you're ordering in Canada or the States. Um, all right. Well, you know, I might launch into this with one question of my own as we continue to wait for the audience to, to kind of type these out here. Um, you just, you sound so passionate about these figures and about your research, and that's something that really comes across tonight. I wondered if there were any other details about these figures you wanted to share with us that kind of didn't fit into the book, you know, and didn't fit into this presentation. What else are you just bursting to tell us? Um, you know, there are, um, there are endless little stories like that, and I tried to, to weave them through as much as I could, and that's part of why I wanted to include so many images. It really is a story that's partly told told in images because it's the other thing that's invented in 19th century France. I always say that everything we assume to be a product of modern contemporary American culture actually had its roots in 19th century France. Um, and that is not an exaggeration. So photography is one of those things and the media and celebrity, all of that is invented in 19th century France. Um, and so there are just all these incredible um, photographs that Jules Lafoy took and, I, and, and that um, were taken of the various the other, the other two figures as well. Um, one thing I, I was actually just looking at today because I, when I would go to the libraries, I would take pictures as that's the wonderful thing about doing research. These days, you can take the archive home 
um, to the extent that the librarians will let you, you know, depending on the permissions. Um, and so I, there's stuff that I, I haven't really even gone fully through. But one thing I just noticed in the past um, few days is that, um, so Judafwa kept these biographies handwritten of gender crossers from previous time periods. And, um, and they seem sort of straightforward, just sort of she went and did research in the libraries and, and, and wrote, these, wrote their stories out. But um, I saw that on the cover page of the Abbé de Choisy, who was um, pretty famous in France and born in the 17th century, lived into the 18th century, she'd crossed out his name, she'd crossed out ab the Abbé and switched it to Dame de Calité. So the Abbé is sort of known for having these different identities or, you know, uh, being kind of an early trans figure. Um, and it looks like Judah was actually kind of regendering or trying to make sure that we understand the Abbé based on their own research as feminine rather than masculine who sometimes quote unquote cross-dressed, which is I think generally, well, that's what you'll find on, on, on Wikipedia. Um, so um, so there's, there's still kind of more things that I'm, I'm hunting down in terms of all of these figures. Great, thank you. And uh, we do have a queue of questions now, so I'll jump right in. Uh, the first one comes from Elizabeth, who's asking, did you come across other gender specific laws like the restriction of pants wearing? Um, that's really the main one. And it wasn't always, I mean, I, I, I'm sure that there were, there, you know, people were brought into the police for much less. Um, but of course, this is all very class based. So if you these are this is a very kind of elite practice for these three, um, and so they were mostly protected. But there was a moment actually when Multifo did something very public um, because she, they were very upset about something that had been written about them, and they slapped the editor of Le Figaro, who had published something um, kind of uh, denigrating about about that seemed to be about them, at the Comédie Française took a copy of the newspaper and slapped him in male clothing. And so they weren't immediately, Multipo wasn't really immediately recognized because it was one of the first moments that they had come out in public dressed this way. Um, and that evoked a kind of um, crackdown on the pants permit because as it was reported on in the newspapers, they were saying, you know, don't we have a law against this? Um, and so ironically, their own behavior kind of made people remember because these things were obviously um, enforced sporadically um, and dependent on um, some other things going on. But it was actually a time of a great deal of gender exploration. Um, so there wasn't a lot legally that they were facing. Um, it was just that the pants permit really loomed large because, um, you know, it was a because this was a really personal thing that they were doing. And anytime it's evoked in all three of them, you feel that sensitivity. Um, whereas this is kind of what my research was about when I encountered that as a feminist historian, it was sort of like, oh, rebellious, you know, get your pants permit and, and go out and, um, and do rebellious things. Um, and, it, and the biographies here really just sort of try to restore the whole kind of human piece. And as a kind of complex and sensitive um, element that really um, allows us to understand the stakes, I think, much more clearly. Right. Um, I think the next question that I'll move to is is kind of the, the modern version of that one. So Pam is interested to know, you know, in your opinion, how much work is there left to do concerning gender specific restrictions? Um, I assume she means more so today rather than through your research. Um, I mean, I think that in the U.S., you know, I think this is, is it's kind of culturally specific to this day. Um, and in the U.S., and of course, I'm in New York, so I, I may have a, <laughs> a different vantage point. Um, but, you know, it's been a kind of trans moment the past 10 years or so. And so these things are really um, being discussed very openly, despite the fact that it's still very hard to be trans in most places in the country, and there are all kinds of laws, and, and, and it's, it's just there's all kinds of challenges. And of course, um, the, this current outgoing administration um, has been, uh, you know, really making things very difficult for young people, especially. Um, but um, in other places, people aren't as far, far along, right? In the UK, very, very different. And in France, 
um, I think they're probably many years behind where the US is in terms of, of talking about these things and it being really kind of in the air um, in the same way. So there's a lot of work left to be done. This is a brand new part of scholarship. So there's a lot of work in terms of finding this trans history and figuring out how to find it before it was named as such. Um, and there's certainly, you know, uh, and, and I mean, I see that that work as very important to the, to the other part of the question of, in terms of where we are presently, because seeing that this has just always been there and that um, different societies and time periods have found different ways to articulate it and interact with it um, and, 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 and conceive of, of transness, I think helps us um, to understand where we are today. This is just simply a way of being um, and it's not a crisis and, and it's not new. I totally agree. I think your work contributes a lot to kind of, I mean, for those people who are skeptical about these, these types of identity crises or questions, I think it, it shows us that there's a, there's a historic trend. It's a very normal thing to interrogate these categories. And I admire that you've, you've done this work. Um, so the next question is from Megan, who says, you mentioned uh, Jean d'Arc as a historical reference for these three amazing people. Were there other people, uh, specifically women, in French history that uh, these three women could refer to for inspiration or guidance? Um, yeah, so thank you for that question. That's something that um, I'm really um, continuing to follow up on because I think there's a whole genealogy here. And, um, and that leads up to the present day. So as recently as you know, 10, 15 years ago, kind of before the current trans moment, there were works by Leslie Feinberg and others that try to catalog um, before we even had kind of the trans language, but there's a book called Transgender Warriors in which, um, and I mentioned this in my conclusion, there's a photo, there's a photo of Jane and Marcel Dulafoy that tries, doesn't really understand who they are, but says, is this a, a homosexual couple or a trans couple, you know? Um, and I thought that was so interesting because part of what my book was doing was also that same gene genealogical work. Um, Jules Foy had biographies, sketches of biographies, drafts of biographies that she was working on with Marcel of about 10 at least gender crossers over time. They were all um, uh, what we would call transmasculine, uh, I think. Um, or at least that's how historically they've been remembered actually, because there's still a lot of work to do on those folks because the, you know, from my, where I sit as a 19th century person, um, I, I don't know all the ins and outs. You know, there's the Chevalier Dion who was very known in the 19th century and who we now maybe should be calling the Chevalier. But, um, you know, so, so, you know, whether it's transmasculine, transfeminine actually is uh, something that is yet to be determined. Um, but what is clear is that in every generation, um, these individuals are looking for, as we all do, looking for models of selfhood. Um, and in the 19th century, they had to look to the past because for some reason it was more visible in the past than in their own time period. Um, even in a time period where gender exploration seemingly was everywhere, as I mentioned with all those writers and we know there's all these gender shifts and things like that, um, they understood the difference between you know, someone who is doing this kind of role reversal playfulness versus someone who is living this way because that's who they are. And that's what they were all looking for. Um, and so, I mean, I list them, I list the ones in Jules Foy's archives and there's, there's more work um, to be done on that, that particular topic as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is from Zaire, who's saying, uh, thanks, Rachel, for such a beautiful presentation of your work. I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about how you navigated and constructed your theoretical framework um, dealing with, I guess, contemporary theories of trans queer studies and 19th century French literature. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so my book is not very theoretical. I'm kind of funny this way. I'm actually working on, um, for a more kind of scholarly journal, a uh, methodological essay. And it's funny to have read a book and not really know what your methodologies were, when obviously you must have had methodologies because you, you wrote the book. Um, and I tend to kind of internalize them and not necessarily make them totally explicit, which is maybe hard, not helpful for, for other people then if they want to follow. But, um, but what, I was mo what most directed me in this work, I wasn't trying to say, are they this or are they that? What box can I put them in? You know, and I could have looked at a million different ways of being trans. Are they genderqueer? Are they this? Are they that? Um, 
I didn't want to look too much at theoretical models. I looked at first person accounts and I read and listened to as many trans voices as I possibly could in every form that I could find, you know, podcasts, film, memoirs. I read tons of first person memoirs because that was sort of what alerted to me to the resonance in the first place that in some, sometimes in trans memoirs, contemporary American trans memoirs, you find this recourse to storytelling and people talk about their childhood and not knowing how to understand themselves. And so therefore they made up stories. And that's what made me realize, oh, that was what Judafwa was doing. And I think that's what Rashil was doing as well. Um, and so I started seeing all these echoes between the contemporary stuff. Of course, I don't wanna say, look, it's exactly like this, it's exactly like that. But having those voices in my head of the multiple ways in which this kind of, this, you know, under the very expansive rubric of trans, one might experience one's life allowed me not to focus on this is definitively X while this one is definitively Y, but rather to reframe it and to say, let's see this instability and let's listen to what they have to say. So in fact, one of the methodological frameworks kind of after the fact I realized is one that is used in, um, I mentioned the gender creative, there's a book called the gender creative trial that's kind of the trans Bible for parents of kids with trans, with, with, not with trans, who are parents of trans kids. Um, and it says, listen to your children, they will tell you who you are. It's a basic parenting tip, right? As a parent, um, I know this too. And that's kind of what I did for my subjects, having, sh having opened it up so that I could hear what they were telling me, right? And so I said, oh, I think this is what they're talking about. Now let me just let them speak for themselves where I can actually hear. And when I did that, the Rashil says a million different ways, I am not a woman, right? And without understanding or having a framework of transness, you think, oh, she's being so, well, she's so rebellious and she's so provocative. Um, but then once it's trans, you're thinking, oh, they're, they're trying to, they're saying it and they realize at a certain point they can just be really explicit because no one knows what they're talking about. Um, and so they did in many ways simply say, you know, De La Foy has a story about literally becoming a heroic man. Um, and so that's what I found that when I shifted the framework, um, it was quite visible. Um, and so I think that's what opens things up to, to, to further research. Now, it was still a bio biography that that was another piece of it was to really, um, it's a kind of intuitive process. I'd never written biography before. So I, the whole thing was a, a fun, it was just a really different kind of work. Um, and that's why I like to show pictures of their handwriting or things that they actually wrote, the things that the objects they touched. And that's why being in Julafwa's house was so um, just incredible of an experience because biography is very intuitive. Um, and it meant reading their, as, just as I listened to many, many trans voices, I listened to their voices, listened for repetitions, listened for, looked for the places where I felt like they were really working, you know, the kind of flash points. Um, and so that was kind of my, my methodology. Um, it's terrible to say intuition was my methodology, um, but to really live with these people and to, I think that um, as a scholar, this is something that I was, haven't really, as a literary scholar, especially wasn't really taught, um, but it, as a feminist, um, this is where it comes from in me, is that, is the humanism of it, right? To remember that these are people. These books are not just artistic, I mean, they're artistic productions because artists created them. Um, and sort of to use what we know about humans and how they work to understand the past. I don't see the past as something totally, um, you know, separate from the present. That's part of my methodology. Um, which is to understand that humans are humans. And so if I can take what I know about the 19th century, obviously, and, and, and temper what I'm, what I'm interpreting, um, but just knowing these are people who experienced pain and, and, and joy and all of those things, that was actually the kind of switch for me to understand books that I had read in a very academic context. Right. So we're very quickly coming up on our hours together here, but I will sneak in one last question if I can. It came in um, from somebody who's wondering about Colette as a cross-dressing writer, if that was something you investigated. Um, yeah, so I've written about Colette before. Um, she's in my first book. Um, most of the, the writers here, when they dressed in, their, their gender transition was kind of definitive. So even though their clothes kind of shift, um, they never stop exploring these questions. 
Um, but I think Colette is on a continuum because Colette can certainly be understood in a queer context. She, you know, had female lovers. Um, the dressing isn't so much a part, an irrevocable part of her identity where in order to appear in public, she could only appear in pants once she realized that's how she liked to appear. Um, so, um, but what I also say about, and uh, often when I, I give a talk, people say, oh, what about this person? What about that person? And I say, yeah, exactly. I don't know. I haven't, I haven't done that work, you know, but yeah, go back and look because I, I love that question because the, the point is don't assume. No one in the 19th century ever left in their diary, I am trans, nor did they ever write, um, I am a man you know, trapped in a woman's body they, or vice versa. That just wasn't, I, I've yet to find that. Um, but there's all kinds of other ways in which they tried to tell a story um, in this broader sense about their gender. Um, and so Colette was for, for sure playing with gender. Um, and that is somewhere you know, on a spectrum with what was going on here, um, even though it's not about, I, it, to my, from, from what I know, having actually done, you know, work on Colette, um, I think that it's it's in a separate category, but um, but I think we have to widen the ways that we, we think about feminism and feminist history and women writers in order to account for these questions. Great, well, thank you for answering all of these great questions for speaking to our community tonight as well, Rachel. And I wanted to end, of course, with a word of congratulations because your book was shortlisted for the American Library in Paris Book Award in 2020. You were one of six titles selected by um, selected by our community to be up for this, this very prestigious award. So congratulations on having been shortlisted. Um, and then to, to everybody who's, who's made it through with us past an hour here, I'll just wrap up again by saying that the American Library in Paris uh, is a nonprofit and we do welcome donations. Typically in person, we welcome, you know, about 10 euros per person per event. And so if that's something you're still interested in contributing, um, even through a virtual event, you can visit the link that went out and it was just above the Zoom link in the email that I sent out this morning. Um, and you'll find a uh, a link to, to click through to support the library. If you're interested in doing that, we would very much appreciate it. So thank you again to Rachel. Thank you to our audience for your wonderful questions and contributions. And I hope to see everybody here again soon for another event. Thank you so much. Bye, until next time.